I didn't realize well, that's that. an interesting question. You know, I've never heard of it from the. So let's talk about that. Let's talk no, about. I think that. you need to come over, stand in my to shoes, agree to disagree. This is Top of Mind. I'm Julie Rose. Each week on the show, we take a topic that people feel strongly about, and we go searching for perspectives on that topic that help us feel more empathy and hope, and maybe a little challenged. We're not trying to change your mind. We just think that in a world that's so divided, there is power in thinking more deeply about why we see things the way we do. And we believe that can help us become better citizens, more effective advocates, and kinder neighbors. Today's topic, the right and wrong of relationships. It was one of the greatest moments of my life because I was like, oh my God, she wrote me back. Back about eight years ago, Amy Wineland Daughters was like a lot of us, busy with family and work, close with a handful of friends, but not keeping up with all the people who've mattered in her life, beyond the yearly Christmas cards, maybe an occasional phone call. I think I was a good friend to people, but I don't think that I was very deliberate in my relationships. I'm not good at staying in touch. And then, out of the blue, she began a correspondence that became more deliberate and way more meaningful than she could have imagined. And it was also... Quite possibly the most ridiculous thing I've ever done. Here's what happened. Well, Dana was someone I met at a summer camp. And right after I graduated from high school in 1986, I was a counselor. It was Camp Olympia in Trinity, Texas. We spent about six weeks that summer together, and we were out of touch for 30 years. But I would always, every once in a while, something in my head would be like, oh, I wonder what happened to Dana. And so then in 2014, when Dana popped in my head and I was on Facebook, I looked her up. And you know what I immediately found was that her son, Parker, was battling cancer. She asked for prayers when he was going through a specifically hard chemo dose. And so I sent her a Facebook message because I'm somebody who likes to pray and just said, I'm praying for you. You may not remember who I am, but I'm praying for you. And then unbelievably, like three days after that, she Facebook messaged me back and said, thanks. But that was really the only direct communication we had in 30 years. You speed forward about, uh, about eight months after that, and she posted that he's relapsed. And so we went to, we actually went to church that Sunday and I was, you know, listening to the songs and whatever and praying. And I just got this clear notion and it was like, you know what? I'm going to start writing them her, Parker and Dana letters at the Ronald McDonald house. And I just thought, okay, that's how I'm gonna do it. I felt really committed about it. So then I realized, well, where, where am I actually going to send these letters? Can I send letters to the Ronald McDonald house or how am I going to do that? And so the next, that Sunday night or Monday morning, I looked at her Facebook again and she written this treatise. And she went through all the things she was thankful for, the people who were going to support her, her friends, the doctors, the nurses, which is unbelievable when you've just gotten this horrible diagnosis. And at the end of the very end of this Facebook post is, you know, and here's our address at the Ronald McDonald House because we love to get letters and cards. And that just blew me away because I was like, wait a second. I mean, is this part of something bigger? I think I was probably six to eight letters in when, um, you know, sadly, Parker passed away. He was 15. And so that, that led to me, again, you know, I was wondering what I was going to do because, of course, I had it in my own mind that I was going to write them until Parker went back home, write the two of them. So we go back to church. I sit there again and think, okay, what am I supposed to do? And then I just, again, I just got a clear notion or picture, like, you know, I'm just going to keep writing the letters. And this was kind of a pivotal point in the whole story because I went home, I bought a card, and I thought, well, where do I send it? Because this girl's just a Facebook friend. Like, I don't really know which town in Southern Louisiana she really lives in. And I remembered her husband, uh, who I knew at camp as well, was a lawyer. So I, you know, I did what we all do. I went on Google and stalked him, got his law address, and I sent the condolence card there. And then I just kept writing letters. I kept writing her every week and telling her I was praying for her. And I really didn't know what to say about grief. So then I just started telling her about my life, and you know, which is not very exciting, but just felt, you know, filling in blanks and week after week after week. And I wrote, and, and I did get to the point where I was like, you know, what am I doing and how long is this going to happen? But then we get to April of that year. Um, and I go out, it's my birthday, my 47th birthday, I go out to our mailbox, and there it is, a letter from Dana. And that's when we became pen pals, and we're still pen pals. It was just beautiful, because it turned this into a real relationship. And I was so just bedazzled by the fact that 
you know, I could write this random person out in space and have this kind of experience. I thought, what else is out there among these people, these 580 Facebook people? I mean, what, what else is out there? And, and I just sat down and said, I'm going to write all of them. And I didn't ever really think I was going to finish. And uh, it just changed me. How many friends are enough for a good life? That is one of the big questions that comes out of Amy Wineland daughter's story for me. I've never been one to want lots of relationships in my life. Just a few deep ones do the trick. But I know people who think I must be miserably lonely. They collect vast networks and work hard to maintain them. At a minimum, many of us have at least a few relationships that we are born with and we're wired to care deeply about. But did you know that one in four Americans is currently estranged from a family member? Now, everyone's situation is personal, of course. But the consequences of our relationship choices are not ours alone. Might this divided world be a little less so if we tended to all of our ties more mindfully. Okay, but writing a letter to every person you're friends with on Facebook? I thought it was ridiculous from day one. Still, Amy Wineland Daughters was so moved by the deep connection she had discovered with her new pen pal, Dana. It didn't even matter that she had no mailing address for most of her 580 Facebook friends. She was gonna try. So I took all the Facebook people, put them in an Excel spreadsheet, you know, name by name by name. Then I printed out the spreadsheets. I, I cut all the little names into little slips of paper with their names on them, and then I shoved them all into this little brown box, uh, which I wrote on the top of the box. You know, this is about God's love. It's not about you, because that's what I learned from Dana. Put the box on my desk, and then I sat down and wrote basically the rules. Everyone was gonna get a letter. Each letter had to be two pages. Um, I was going to try to reply to everyone who replied to me. And I bought some stationery. It says, your Facebook friend, Amy Wineland Daughters, which a lot of people thought that was funny. And so that first day, I sat down and I pulled the first name out. And my, my immediate thought was, oh, no, now I have to really write this person a letter. And I was completely like, what have you done? And what were you thinking? But, but it, it began. Two pages? <laughs> I mean, yeah. what? that's a lot of stuff to say to somebody that you might not even really know. <laughs> I think I'm a crazy person, you know, and I think that this, I mean, I don't know. I think that there was some unworld, otherworldly commitment and determination in this whole thing that, that, uh, that I just got bestowed with because <laughs> I was so non-intentional about, I was, I just didn't know how this was going to play out. And here's the way it played out. So the first part of every letter was explaining what I was doing by writing the letters. And I made it clear to everyone that I was writing, I was going to try to write everyone a letter. And I kind of explained about Dana and Parker and some of the letters that introduction evolved, but every letter had an introduction. But then after that, to your question, what do you say? You know, well, first of all, you're going to have to go on this person's Facebook profile, you're really going to have to look at it. And you're really going to, because if, because otherwise you're not going to have anything to say. So number one, you're going to find out some amazing things about these people that you're connected to. This person is a foster parent. This person tried out for American Ninja Warrior. This person went to Princeton. You know, this person is a missionary. This person is whatever. And you're like, oh my gosh, I'm connected to these amazing accomplished people. And then the other thing that happened over and over and over again is you, I sat back and thought, look how this person fit into my life. Because inevitably, you're going to write about your connection with that person, whether it was when you were dorks and band in seventh grade, or you were standing in the back of somebody's wedding for 15 minutes, you danced, and you, you were like, oh my gosh, this is my person. And then you Facebook friend them, and then you don't even know who they are. But then over and over again, I got the opportunity to say, hey, thanks for being my friend in high school. Hey, that was fun at that wedding that night. Hey, and then some of it was profound. Thanks for, you know, the things you, you know, you taught me, you were like a mentor to me. And, and all of a sudden, and I know that probably meant something to all the people that received those words. But to me, Julie, it was like my grateful meter went off the charts. I was like, wow, relationally speaking, these 580 random people, they fit into this beautiful, amazing puzzle of my life. She tells the whole story in her new book, Dear Dana. That time I went crazy and wrote all 580 of my Facebook friends a handwritten letter. 
(laughs) The very first name she pulled out of the box was, ironically, another old friend from summer camp. I love the first letter, and the the, the whole first letter is in the book because it is more... Is, to me, it's a little more awkward than the other letters, but I, I did what I just, you know, what I said. I went and looked at her her Facebook profile and I wrote the letter. I mean, it, it's an okay letter, but then the funny part was, I was like, okay, this was the first letter. And I was like, I don't have her address. So I Facebook messaged her and I felt like a fool saying, oh, I wrote you a letter like randomly, like I have not spoken to you in seven years, but can I please have your physical home address because I'm sending you a letter. Mm -hmm. And I I remember putting my phone down and was like, oh my God, what are you doing? You know, the thought I had over and over again through this whole thing. And I swear it was seven minutes and it dinged. And she was like, oh my God, it's so good to hear from you. Here is my physical home address. I can't wait to get your letter. And I was like, wow. And so mail the letter off. I get a Facebook message from her probably four or five days later. And then I get a, a beautiful letter from her about two weeks after that. And uh, and then we were off. That was the beginning. How often did people actually write you back? Either, you know, a paper letter or, or even just acknowledge on Facebook? I got, of the 580 letters I wrote, I've got 431 responses in some way. So that's 74%. I'm kind of a numbers girl, but, uh, and the highest percentage, about 33% of those people did write me back physically. And people were so excited about sending me a card or a letter back. And people would say, they said hilarious things too. They're like, oh my God, I'm going to have to put aspirin cream on my hand after I write this. <laughs> I couldn't find a stamp. I bought stationery on Amazon just so I could write you back. <laughs> I don't even know where my post office is, you know? <laughs> and then after that, there was about 28% people who responded during via Facebook Messenger, email. I had a couple phone calls, which I thought was really brave in our in our electronic world. Mm. So how important were the responses? Like did you feel disappointed when you mailed a letter and it was just crickets? You never heard a thing. No, because I got to the point, especially midway to the end of the project, where I wanted to hear back from people, but I began to feel guilty that I could not write everyone back like I wanted to. And I also, one of the really light bulb moments in terms of responses was my sister-in-law, I, I met, she was an early letter and she sent me a text about, hmm, I don't know, four weeks after a letter. And she said, I just want you to know that I've had a piece of paper on my desk for four weeks that said, dear Amy, and I, I just don't know what to say. And she said, I realized that, you know, when you went to the effort sending me that beautiful letter that I should respond, but I, I, you know, I I realized I don't know how to respond. So I'm just sending this text, but I want you to know, I think I'm going to have that in common with a lot of people. So don't think that your words aren't everything to somebody just because you don't hear back from them. And I, and I think that it's such an important message because we don't really need a response to know we've made a difference. And that's one of the big takeaways for me from this project, because I think the letter's did so much good, but most of it I'll never know about. A detail that I think is really important here for people for, to, to understand the context of what you were doing is that this was, you were writing these letters during the 2016 presidential election cycle. Right. When Facebook was really an un- unpleasant place <laughs> for a lot of people. Like everybody felt it if they were on Facebook. Were you, did you unfriend anybody so you wouldn't have to write them one of these letters? No, that's a great question because that was one of the rules. I couldn't unfriend somebody just because I didn't want to write them. But I think one of the the best things that come out of this, because it was written, all these letters were written during that time period, is that I wrote to a lot of people who I don't politically identify with, you know, who don't believe the same things I believe, don't believe in God or have a different approach to religion than I did. And then, you know, they, they wrote me back in goodwill and, and, and it told me they appreciated me saying what they said. And then, you know, stay in touch, you know, you're my friend and, you know, I love you. And when somebody says that to you, it doesn't matter where they stand on the political spectrum anymore. You know, and I, one of the final letters was letter 579 was to a girl who absolutely were totally on different spectrums politically. But in that letter, um, there's a line in my letter to her, and it says, I'm glad we're friends, and I'm glad we're different. It's what makes the world better, and it's how change really begins. Hmm. And I think that speaks volumes to, you know, the situation we're in and what this story is about. 
would you describe for us w- one of the more difficult letters to write? Um, I wrote a letter to, I was very close with my father-in-law and he actually passed away um, just as the letter writing ended. Um, and he was, he was on a third marriage and, and uh, she was, it was a complicated relationship and we had not been as close since he had been married to her. And so I wrote, and it's funny how there were so many times with timing in this book, I would draw names out at a weird moment that seemed, you know, again, I think it was God, but, you know, I would write somebody a letter and they would get it on a day that they needed it. Or, but I pulled her name out probably seven days after he passed. And so I didn't really know what to say. And so I thought about the letter for a long time. And I finally said, you know, I'm glad you were there with him because she was at the end. And I appreciate that. And I, we appreciate that he wasn't alone. It was hard to write, but it ended up being a really good letter. Um, the funny thing is she unfriended me afterwards and she's the only person who unfriended me during the project. Hmm. So do you know what happened? No, but then she's reconnected after that, probably six months after that, she refriended me and, Hmm. and we don't really have a relationship, but she, you know, she's been in contact about this book, but that was just a hard letter to write because that relationship was, wasn't good. And, you know, it, it happened the time it was so weird to write a letter right after that when I had all those emotions. Yeah. So, I mean, I just think about, I'm sure all of us have people in our Facebook, <laughs> Facebook um, friends groups that, you know, like thinking about writing a letter to them because of whatever's gone down in our past. <laughs> it's like, oh, I don't, I do I want to even like open that yeah. door or how do I see? say like what you know what they said hurt me or I was hurtful to them and you know I'd rather just kind of let that dog lie right right well and there was there was two people who had uh who I had fired you know and let go or I'd had to let go and one of those letters is in the book and you know and I thought those same things the same thought process you just had I was like why do I even say that and I just I think I said in the letter you know this stuff that happened at work you know um it happened the way it happened. And I realized that you were a good friend to me and it, it, and I've always felt bad about that. And I just want you to know that, you know, I did what I had to do, but I've always felt bad because, you know, I, you're a person with a family. And so I don't know how I worded it, but I said that. And I was, I dropped that letter in the mail. Julia was like, Oh, I hope this is one of the ones I don't hear, hear back from. Like, there's no telling what she's going to say. Mm-hmm. And she wrote me this beautiful Facebook message. Mm-hmm. Your letter was, you know, so beautiful. I've never received a letter like that. And she said, you know, she didn't say anything about the fire. And she said, I just want to tell you that I loved you and we'll be friends forever. And I, I was just like, just by taking that step and writing that letter. And I wrote it because I had to. So it's not like out of the goodness of my heart, I wrote this girl that I fired. You know, I wrote this, but taking that step means if she whizzes around with her card at at Kroger next week at the grocery store, at the Walmarts. I, I'm not going to be afraid to see her now. It took Amy Wineland daughters nearly two years until at last there was just one name left in her box with the words, this is about God's love. It's not about you, written on the lid. It was one of the best finish lines you know, of my life, for sure. I had written 579 on a Wednesday it was late. And I was like, oh, I could write 580 right now. I was like, no, no, I'm going to write 580 tomorrow. So I got up that morning, Julie, and I was like, I'm going to write one more Facebook letter. And then it's peace out. You know, the last letter was this girl I grew up across the street from. And it was it was four pages because I had to, you know, all my feelings had to be on display. And I had to be, I was super introspective. And then I literally put it in the envelope, put the stamp on it. And I got up and danced all the way through the house, dancing, jumping up and down. I felt so good. I felt so full because there had been so much love exchanged in these letters. I mean, I should have had a ribbon stick and some glitter (laughs) and some Disney princess stuff going on because it was just such a phenomenal, profound moment that should have never have been probably. Yeah. What what did you learn about the nature of friendship and, 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 you know, staying in touch with people when it matters, when it doesn't? Well, I think it's really important to draw that line between the circle of friends that you do life with, whether they're near you physically or not. And then the circle of friends that are just truly social media friends, because I believe 
I don't think social media is inherently bad because it creates a community. There is a community there. There is something good. There is something good about staying in touch, but you cannot draw that those human needs we have to be loved and listened to and taken seriously and taken care of, you know, that can't be done online. So we have to, we have to take care of each other outside of that. And what I learned is if, if, I can take care of the people in my circle and you can take care of the people in your circle. And then the people I wrote to who I could not take care of because they were not in their circle. If we all take care of each other's circle, we're going to be fine. But it's important that we draw a line between those two things. Are you doing your in-person relationships differently as a result of this experience? Absolutely. Because when people wrote me, and like I said, and shared things that were very personal, it's because of my concern for those people I wanted their people to take care of them. So I was like, I better take care of my people. So we absolutely, adapted, you know, it deepened my relationships in my life. Like really checking in, really checking and saying, how are you really? You know, what can I do for you? And then making sure I showed up for people that I could show up for. Because I couldn't show up for all these 500 people, but I could show up for these 10 people. So um, w- what is the lesson you hope people take from this book that you've written about your experience? I really hope that people are inspired not to write 600 letters. I mean, like, if that's your game, then go for it. But I hope people are inspired, you know, to do something big, maybe that they don't think they can do on their own terms. And I'm hoping people will be inspired to reach out to each other. Like, again, not on this level, because that's crazy. But I, I just hope that people see that we live in this divisive world, that we're also convinced that there's so many things that separate us, that that maybe, maybe, just maybe, that hope that we're all so desperately looking for is right next to us, sitting right next to us as a friend on the other end of a phone line, on the other end of the screen, that maybe we are each other's hope. And all we have to do is exercise some simple things to give hope to someone else and give hope to ourselves. And I think if I could have anything out of this book is that people would be hopeful because of each other. Amy Wineland Daughters is the author of Dear Dana. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for writing this book. Thank you for having me on. It was a pleasure. If there is hope to be found in deepening our connections and extending our circles, how far do we look? What about the strangers we encounter every day? Would there be any point to striking up conversations with them? It gives you understanding. It gives you empathy. And, and you know, if practiced enough and, and mindfully enough, I think it'll make for a wiser person and a better citizen. That's Joe Cohane. He wrote a book called The Power of Strangers, The Benefits of Connecting in a Suspicious World. And here I thought writing letters to Facebook friends was a little much. This is Top of Mind. I'm Julie Rose. Joe Cohane is not someone who just naturally goes around chatting with people he doesn't know. But he grew up with a couple of people who did. Yeah, I was raised by funeral directors, actually, but they were very chatty. So my parents are pretty unafraid about seeking out these sorts of interactions. They'll reach across a table in a crowded restaurant and start talking to somebody if they see something that's interesting to them. Hmm. Uh, And they're really good at it. They're so warm and they're so open and they're so inquisitive that... It people let their guards down. And and I kind of grew up watching that, seeing them live like that, seeing how rich a life it was. Um, for me, though, I was kind of in the middle of the spectrum. I mean, I talked to strangers as part of my job as a journalist, and I used to talk to strangers more in kind of public situations, if you're on the train, if you're in a bar, something like that. Um, but I realized, you know, a little while ago, before I started this book project, that I had stopped completely. I had completely cut out that entire category of human interaction. And I wanted to know why. I wanted to know what made me stop doing it. And and I wanted to know what happens when we do seek out those interactions, when we do talk to strangers. And that sent me me down about 15 different rabbit holes. And those rabbit holes led to his book, The Power of Strangers, The Benefits of Connecting in a Suspicious World. He knows most of us will find his thesis daunting. 
And there are a cocktail of factors. It can be anything from, you know, being subjected to a lot of stranger danger propaganda when we were kids. You know, certainly when I was a kid, it was an endless parade of cops coming into my classroom, warning us that literally everyone in the world we'd never met poses a mortal threat to us. Mm -hmm. It turns out that that's not a great message to teach kids um, because kids, when they're in a crisis situation, are often going to have to turn to strangers. Um, but that can affect our trust. It can affect the, the perception of people around us. Um, social stress, social factors, you know, kind of racism, things like that can really factor into it. But, you know, according to one of the psychologists, Jillian Sandstrom at the University of Essex, who's really extensively studied this, the one thing that that is most common that keeps people from having these interactions is a fear that they don't know how to do it. Hmm. Right. So they fear that, they, you know, they're, they're worried that they, they're not allowed to do it. It's against the social norm, which it kind of is. But they're worried that even if they were going to try, they were going to stink at it. They, they weren't going to know what to say. They were going to look weird. The people are going to reject them. All these things. It seems like that's the single biggest, biggest stumbling block to getting people to have these interactions. Yeah. OK, well, I'm nodding my head to all of those. But help me with the other side of it, the why should I bother? I mean, all right. So maybe you could have some interesting conversations. But, you know, am I really missing out that much? It turns out that uh, you are missing out by by not talking to, to people that you don't know. Um, over the last 15 years or so, we've seen a raft of new um, psychology research into what happens. And those researchers have found, and you know, this research has taken place everywhere from Toronto to Turkey, that when people do engage with strangers, when they take the initiative to chat with someone at the coffee shop or you know, God forbid, talk to someone on the train or the bus, um, they find that it goes very well. They find that it goes much better than they expected. They find that it's pretty easy to find something to talk about. Um, the studies have found that these conversations go on significantly longer than the people expected them to in a good way and in, in a way that pleases the people. They're not trapped in an endless conversation. Hmm. Um, but they come away from these, these interactions, and these could be fleeting, they could be more meaningful, whatever, um, feeling happier, feeling less lonely, feeling more connected to the places where they live. There's even research that shows that contact with people who are different than us can alleviate prejudice, it can alleviate polarization. Um, and, you know, the big thesis for the book, for me, is that it really is an engine for empathy at a time when there's a shortage of empathy. When you do interact with a stranger, number one, if it does go well, and it usually does, you gain a maybe more balanced or more positive perspective of humans. Um, and if you're talking to a stranger who's different from you, who has a different perspective or has a different background, it gives you the opportunity to experience their life for a moment, right? It gives you, it, it, it takes away the luxury of believing that everyone's reality is the same as your reality. It gives you understanding. It gives you empathy. And, and you know, if practiced enough and, and mindfully enough, I think it'll make for a wiser person and a better citizen. So that means that the kind of conversation you have with strangers matters. It's got to be more than the, hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm fine. Good. How are you? I'm fine. Have a nice day, buddy. <laughs> right. Like yeah, that, those, that's not really yeah, going to get ones. you the benefit. Right. But those those conversations, you know, this is this was a really interesting vein of research for me, is that when we have those interactions, those kind of mindless rote interactions, we buy something, you say, hey, how you doing? Good. How are you? Fine. Whatever. No one's really listening. No one really cares. And no one's really paying attention. Um, you can use those what they call scripted interactions to initiate a better conversation. So I spent I spent time with a woman named Georgie Nightingale in, in England who teaches classes on conversation. And she taught a class on talking to strangers, which I flew to London to take. Mm -hmm. And her idea is that you can subvert those scripted interactions. You can take a mindless, empty interaction and actually turn it into something good. And the way you do it is by answering truthfully and specifically. So that doesn't necessarily mean that when someone asks how you're doing, you give them like a litany of your medical complaints <laughs> necessarily, but you can be honest and you can be specific. And um, Georgie's genius trick that she came up with for this is when someone says, how you doing? And they don't, you know, they're not really asking. Answer numerically, give them like a, a numerical answer. Say, well, I'd say I'm about a, about a six out of 10. And then you ask them how they're doing. <laughs> and what you've done is you've reframed the conversation. You've like set the terms for how this interaction is going to go. And it alerts the person to the fact that something new is happening here, that you are actually engaged, you're actually paying attention, and you're actually asking a question. And I've done this a million times. And it usually results in them giving a numerical answer back. And now you're talking, right? Like they, they've given you something about themselves. And this doesn't have to take forever. These can be quick. Um, and then Georgie recommends asking them if they say, I'd say I'm about a seven out of 10, ask them what it would get them, what it would take to get them to a nine. Hmm. And then they'll tell you a little bit about their day. And then you can, you know, you'll find something in common or you'll get a little story or something like that. But most importantly, you'll have this little connection 
Um, and those little connections can be really important. You know, if you have enough of them, they really can be a hedge against something like loneliness, which is a serious social problem right now. Really? Just those little random, not even, it's not a heart to heart. It's just a little, oh, well, now I know that the, you know, the cashier at the grocery store, um, you know, that her mom's sick. <laughs> yeah, I had a great one with a, there was a teenage girl at the, the grocery store near me. And I went in and, you know, I was kind of using some of these techniques. I was doing some shopping and she asked me how I was doing. And I had a, you know, my daughter was three at that point and she was experiencing some serious sleep problems. So I was just like, you know, I'm doing pretty well, but to be honest with you, I'm kind of wiped out like my kid. Like she just kept me up all night last night. And the girl who's, you know, different, different age, different race, um, she goes, how old is she? And I was like, she's three. And the girl looks at me and she goes, it'll get better. <laughs> and I love that. And that's all it was, you know, and I, I was, I was grateful and it felt like a little bit of connection and, you know, a kind of connection across a couple different boundaries. Um, mm. And I think, you know, I paid attention to her. She paid attention to me. It just took a second. Um, but I came away from that, like feeling a little spark of connection. Um, so it can be that easy. You know, it's great if you have like a real conversation too, but even the little ones can really work. They can really bind you to the place that you live. What about when you're in a situation where people are not, nobody has talked to you and it's kind of not the thing that people are doing. Do you still try to strike up conversations? Yeah, I got, I got pretty avant-garde with this whole thing. There was a great piece of advice that I got again from that woman, Georgie Nightingale, um, called a, um, it was a pre-frame. And so what that is, is if you're in a situation where it's not the norm to talk to strangers, so you say you're on the subway, right? Um, and everyone's staring at their phones or reading their books or whatever. What you can do in a situation like that is you, if you start talking to someone, they're going to think that there's something wrong. They're going to be suspicious, right? Because this, this isn't common. So what you can do is you can acknowledge that it's not common out of the gate. So say the person is reading a book and you're interested in that book, or there's something interesting about that person, or there's some observation that you can make. Instead of just making it, instead of just asking a question, you start by saying, look, I know we're not supposed to talk to people on the subway, but do you mind me asking and then asking the question? And what that does is that it reassures them that you, there's not something wrong with you, right? You're not an agent of chaos. You understand that you're violating a social norm. Um, and that helps get the defensiveness down a little bit. And then, you know, by observing something that you're both experiencing or maybe, you know, asking them a question about their book or their glasses or whatever it is that you're, that you're interested in, um, that's the opening of the conversation. The conversation can proceed from there. Um, you know, I asked a guy about, a, he had like a, like a bag that I thought was nice and I was looking for a new bag. And then in learning about how we got that bag, I learned about the guy and we ended up having a conversation that went on for like 10 train stops, right? Mm -hmm. And this is like, it was so easy to do, but you do just have to acknowledge that you're doing something unusual so people aren't alarmed and they're not suspicious. Can you just imagine though if everybody was doing this? Like we would never get anywhere <laughs> or get anything accomplished. <laughs> well, it doesn't, it's not like a time suck. That's the thing. So, so there's some research done by um, these psychologists, Nicholas Epley and Juliana Schroeder, and they had people go out on the Chicago mass transit system, and then they replicated this in London later, which is considered a much chillier place socially. And the people expected that they would feel that they were wasting time or that they were less productive as a result of like going out to talk to strangers on the subway. Mm. But when they came back, they said that they didn't feel that way because the reality is like, you're not actually doing that much on the subway. You're just kind of occupying yourself. Um, and when they had these conversations, they learned something. They passed the time in a pleasant way. They found a connection. You know, some of them came out of it making friends. They, they, you know, they arranged to get coffee with the people that they talked to. So it is actually productive. Um, you know, you just have to be very mindful of it. You can't be the person in the supermarket that's going to you know, hold a 15-minute filibuster in a crowded place with 20 people behind you. You do yeah. have to be very socially aware to make sure that you're not being a pest and you're not obstructing the flow of the city. But for me, yeah, it didn't, it didn't feel like I was wasting time. It felt like I was, I was gaining something far more than I was losing something. Joe Cohane is a journalist and author of The Power of Strangers, The Benefits of Connecting in a Suspicious World. So I think the main reason that talking to strangers has a lot of upside is because the stakes are so low. If it flops, the other person might think you're weird and steer clear next time they see you. No harm done. Same with reaching out to acquaintances on Facebook to try and capture the spark of more real connections. The worst case is you just don't hear back from that classmate you sat next to in high school. But the stakes are considerably higher when it comes to the relationships we're born with. Our family relationships are reliable anchors in a complex and difficult world. They're also some of our most fraught, says Cornell University human development professor Carl Pillemer. I was very surprised to find how common estrangement is. 
that 27 percent, over a quarter of the U.S. population, would say that they are currently estranged from a family member. What can or should we be doing to shore up our family ties? I'm Julie Rose. This is Top of Mind. Nobody was really doing large-scale research on family estrangement in America until Carl Pillemer at Cornell University stumbled on the topic while interviewing older people for a book of advice he was writing called 30 Lessons for Living. One question I asked every one of them was, how can a young person get to your age of 80, 90, or 100 and not have any regrets? I wasn't prepared for how many of them listed an unresolved family estrangement as their most important regret. And people became tremendously emotional talking about either an estrangement from their own parents or an especially an estrangement from their children. When he realized there wasn't any good data on how common family estrangement was, he did a nationwide survey. One in four people told him they currently had no contact with someone in their family, and most were upset about the situation, but... I would ask people, what could you have done to prevent this estrangement? And they would say to me, if I knew that, I wouldn't still be estranged. Then he had a breakthrough. I was talking to an interviewee who I assumed was in a permanent estrangement. She had had a horrible Dickensian childhood. You know, she had experienced abuse. Uh, she was asked to deal drugs for her. A uh, drug dealer father, her mother abandoned the family. And in her 30s, she had reconciled with both of them. And she had not only reconciled with both of them, she had done so in a satisfactory way. It was imperfect, but they were in their lives to some degree, and she felt good about it. That led me to really want to shift my focus to people who had reconciled. Why, in her 30s, did she decide she wanted to have a relationship with the mother who abandoned her and the father who allowed for her to be abused and neglected? So uh, the person who I call Tricia in the book, she had some points in common with many of the people who reconciled. One of those characteristics was a core value about the importance of family. Uh, it's a little bit similar to somebody who stays in a challenging marriage for a couple of difficult years because they believe in the institution of marriage itself. Hmm. So many of the people who reconciled believed in the importance of family, in the importance of sticking together, even if there were challenging components. And that was true of Tricia. She said, this is just who I am. I believe that my family is important. A second characteristic that was common to quite a few people in estrangements was that she had had a child and wanted her grandchild, at least under controlled and protected, you know, environments to know who her grandparents were. Third, before she reconnected, she learned from other family members that both of her parents' situations had improved. Her father had become much healthier her mother had returned and was also in a healthy relationship. So she was able to get over the childhood trauma and look at these parents through a new lens, that they had worked on themselves and had gotten themselves better. So did she get an apology? Her mother, who left and abandoned the family such that she, she wasn't able to be found, I believe, when, when Tricia was in middle school, apologized profusely eventually, but she felt she had to escape the situation, even though she left her daughter with a really bad guy. Her father, in Trisha's words, simply wasn't capable of apology. It wasn't something that was in his, you know, real house to ever do, but he did express a lot of gratitude for her re-engagement. Many people who reconcile do abandon the need for an apology. Mm. Uh, they come to realize that a forced apology probably isn't much of an apology. And in quite a few cases, 
the apology came after the reconciliation. People who reconcile are able to not forget the past or even to forgive it, but they are able to move on to the relationship in the present moment mm. and if the re- and, and allow the improved relationship to occur with Trisha, like everybody who reconciles. She established extraordinarily clear boundaries so with the help of a therapist. She knew beyond which point she would never go again if the rules and regulations she offered to her parents were violated, she was out for good. So she set clear and protective boundaries such that they could never hurt her again as they had before. After meeting Trisha, Carl Pilmer went looking for others who'd reconciled with an estranged family member. I'll give a shout out to national advice columnist Ask Amy, Amy Dickinson, who happens to be a neighbor, who announced in her column that I was looking for people who had reconciled. <laughs> Um, And that brought quite a few people in, in an unusual way. And I was able to accumulate over 100 people Mm. who had successfully reconciled after 1, 10, 20, 30 years. And it's the only study that's ever done that. And and what what are the primary reasons? If this is something that's so upsetting for so many people that they'd prefer it not happen, why does it happen to so many people? It's not easy to say causes because it's a complicated problem. But there are several things that many families go through that create a higher risk that an estrangement will occur. One very strong one is problematic childhood in the family. So harsh parenting, extreme parental favoritism, divorce in childhood. Sometimes people who've had an averse childhood have great difficulty overcoming it, even if things are better later, and that can lead to estrangement. Differences in values, especially core values, are key. We also found some situational factors. One of those is what I call the problematic in-law. When someone, quote, marries the wrong person, unquote, the family rejects the new partner or the new partner rejects the family can lead at least to a temporary estrangement. And finally, we found that a major cause are conflicts over money wills, inheritance, problems in a family business. It was striking how often financial considerations and problems can get in the way of good family relationships. He also found that in almost every case, there's a cascading breakdown in communication where the contempt and conflict crescendo to a single blow-up, a kind of final straw moment that triggers the estrangement. One of the strongest pieces of advice that individuals who are in estrangements offer is act quickly, go back, look at it, apologize, do what's necessary, because the longer you wait, the more difficult it becomes and the easier it becomes to let the relationship stay as it is, to replace it or to move on. When reconciliation happens, does there typically have to also be some sort of a meeting of the minds? You know, we haven't been in touch for five years. Um, They get back in touch, and then both sides have to sort of come to an agreement about why the estrangement happened and who was justified and who wasn't. I'm sometimes asked, what are some of the most surprising things about this long program of research? The answer to that question was one of the most surprising. In almost all cases of people who successfully reconciled, the answer to do do we have to process the past was no. Generally, people realized a fact that we know from psychological research. In something like an estrangement, people develop their own narratives. They create a personal narrative that places them as the leading actor and in which they were right in terms of what they did. That narrative has then been reinforced by their friends, by other people who may not know the situation, but are on their side. We don't give up those narratives easily. Hmm. And one thing that people who reconciled realized is that the other person was no more likely to abandon their narrative as they were. Almost always people move beyond the need to reconcile the past. Uh, They simply gave that up and focused on the current relationship. People said that, you know, we're never going to agree on whether Johnny, my brother, was just doing normal teasing 
or Johnny, my brother, was a sadist as I was growing up. Mm. And people told me that, I will say, again and again and again. They said, it's difficult for me. I want my brother or I want my mother to understand everything I went through, but I do not believe that's going to happen. And the current relationship is worth having. Why? Why Why? why do they say that even, even though the relationship isn't as warm as it might be otherwise, even though we have all these things we can't talk about, why, why is it worth it to be in touch? Even in our current postmodern anything-goes culture, family relationships are the most stable ones that most people experience. So, for example... If I were to give a survey to people about their social networks now and come back to them 10 years later, many of the people will have changed. Friends changed. Your spouse changes. But the people who are still there as your closest associates are your family members. When people lose those, they aren't immediately or easily replaceable. Uh, Second, there is a biological evolutionary process of attachment between parents and children, where we respond to one another, wanting to protect them if they're in adversity, feeling anxious when we're apart from them. If you decide to become estranged from a parent, child, or sibling who you grew up with, the the countervailing force is feeling a not completely rational feeling of attachment to them. So you want to be back with them even if it's adverse. So I think those are two big reasons. I want to be clear. Not everybody can or should reconcile. There are people who are completely correct to cut off a family relationship and who are probably correct never to try to reconcile unless they do so with extensive professional help And those are people, of course, who have been victims of abuse, of physical abuse, of sexual abuse, and or for whom the person with whom they write that they might reconcile is still a dangerous or abusive person. So there are people for whom it's not good for their mental health to reconcile, and they can decide that with help from a therapist or a counselor. That said, in less extreme situations, a lot of people who went through the difficulty of reconciling were really, really happy they did. When reconciliation is appropriate, how how can someone know that it's time? There are some signs I discovered that people might be ready to reconcile. First is an obvious one. The person's on my mind a lot. I ponder whether I should reach out to the person. That's one sign that you might actually be ready to do it. Many people who reconciled had an aha moment after many years where they decided to pick up the phone. One of the ones I loved the most were two brothers, and they just had had a challenging relationship, many details, but there were tremendous difficulties. They began to have extreme political differences, and this was before our current era. And finally, one of the brothers, who in the book I I call uh, Fletcher, said, I'm done. I I just am done with this. This guy is a jerk. I don't need him in my life. And broke off the relationship. And Fletcher then later was worrying about this and thinking about it and wondering about it. And he went to a church service. His kids were all in town. It was on Christmas. And the person used that time to talk about Uh, this might be a good time to to forgive someone. And he talked to his wife. As he left that service, riding in the car home, said, I'm going to call Arlen. I'm going to call Arlen after 10 years. Tell him I'm sorry. Tell him I want to get our relationship back together. He did. They began to converse by phone. They saw one another. He told me, it's not perfect. If I talk to him too long, I still think he's a jerk. But he said, I don't have to wake up in the morning thinking, why haven't I talked to my brother in 10 years? He said it was like carrying a heavy backpack. It was just carrying this heavy backpack around, and now it was gone. If I were to give one piece of advice for anyone who's at the stage of considering a reconciliation, 
I sum up as one last chance. Create very specific conditions under which the reconciliation can occur, make those explicit, and offer one last chance. I had a number of people who said, who were as specific as this, okay, you come see the grandchildren once every two months. You can't stay in my house. You can't bring your second husband. You cannot criticize my child rearing, and you can't criticize my husband. At the moment any of those occurs, the estrangement is on again for the rest of our lives. It is amazing how many people who had been doing these challenging behaviors towards their kids or parents or siblings were able to make that decision and get back in the relationship. Carl Pillemer is a professor of human development and geriatrics at Cornell. His book about all of this is called Fault Lines, Fractured Families and How to Mend Them. It's full of practical advice and stories, both heartrending and hopeful, that really drove home for me just how fragile family relationships can be. I've often taken for granted that they will be there to fill my social and emotional needs when friendships fall short. And I'm embarrassed to admit that I have flirted dangerously close to estrangement at times. Pillimer's research has led him to believe mending our family ties can do more good than we might imagine. We live in a world right now that is filled with conflict, where conflict is promoted, where people are finding it harder and harder to connect. And many of us feel that we don't have any control over it, that we don't have any control over the political divides, uh, you know, other kinds of sort of angry rifts in society. You can gain a little bit of a sense of control, though, in your own family. If you can overcome some of these differences in your own family, it gives you a sense of hopefulness, I think, of what can go on elsewhere. That if you can create more peace in your family, it might be able to create a more peaceful society. You know, I know that is highly aspirational and idealistic, but I do think if people can mend these fractures within their own family relationships, they can also have a more positive way of looking at fractures that occur elsewhere in society. One last thought about that idea of mending fractures. There's a Japanese art form called kintsugi that repairs broken pottery using lacquer mixed with gold. The scars become a web of shimmering veins. Kintsugi is related to the Buddhist philosophy of wabi-sabi, or seeing beauty in imperfections. Our relationships may be fractured. Our society is clearly fractured. So I'm wondering, what's our golden lacquer? that will turn our ruptures into markers of strength and beauty. Top of Mind is a BYU Radio podcast. Today's episode was produced by me with help from Elizabeth Miller. We had music and sound design by Jacob Molaski and the post-production team at BYU Broadcasting. I'm Julie Rose. We'll talk soon.